In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just the other day, one of my news feeds, I got a, a story, and it was called, The Best Way to Figure Out How Much Wine You Need for a Party. And I thought, wow, if only this bridegroom would have had this, perhaps the whole story would have been changed. You see, a wedding at the time of Jesus was very, very different than what we experience today. The celebration was not an hour, or in some cases I've been to five to ten minutes, followed by a reception where there may or may not be a dinner, a lot of chit-chat and socialization going on, but wedding at the time of Jesus was a true feast. It was a feast that lasted seven whole days, and it was held at the groom's home. Very, very different than what we think of as a wedding. And as I read this story, one that we are all, all so familiar with, the changing the water into wine, stories, jokes, all kinds of things about this story, and we're so familiar with it. And as much as this story is so striking and so beautiful in so many ways, what really, really hit me this year was not about the changing of water into wine, but about the role that Mary plays in it, about her words, her simple words. They have no wine. These words have haunted me all week. We don't get any details about why Jesus and Mary were at this wedding. Was this a neighbor? Was this a family friend? Were they relatives? Was Mary the beloved aunt? Was this Jesus' childhood buddy that he had grown up with? We don't get much information about that. But for me, what did become the, the takeaway point this week was the role that Mary plays. How she saw something that was a problem. How she saw something that was going to cause embarrassment and then tried to do something about it. And then we hear Jesus' response to his mother. I would say it's flip at best. I think today we might hear something like, it's not my problem. Or, I'm having a good time with my friends. Don't bother me right now. I don't want to be disturbed. Or perhaps even something like, why don't you let them worry about it? They probably have something in the back, and they just don't really ready to bring it out yet. Just, just calm down, Mom. Don't worry about it. But Mary doesn't buy it. She doesn't buy it. And she knows her son, and she knows the goodness within him. She knows, she knows how, she, how he cares about people. And so she doesn't have a big discussion with Jesus. I imagine she probably gave him that look that mothers get when their child's born. She gives him that look. And she looks at the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. Because in her heart, she knew that Jesus would do something. There is no wine. How many times in our lives do we observe something that in our gut we know isn't right? We may not know all the details of what's going on, but we know something is wrong. We know something is askew. We know something just isn't right. And how many times, how many times have we prayed in our confession, asking forgiveness for that which we have left undone? I believe this is the example that Mary is giving us today. When we see a problem, when we experience an issue where we know something isn't right, we are called, we are called to respond. So 
What can we learn from Mary? I think first is that Mary noticed. She was aware of what was going on around her. She didn't live in her own little world. She was aware of what was going with her, on with her neighbors and her friends. And she saw something that was about to become a big embarrassment. And she tried to help. I think the next thing we can learn from Mary is that she tells the right person. She doesn't go and talk around anybody else. She just says to Jesus, they have no wine. Mary knows her son. She knows who Jesus is. In John's Gospel, we don't get all the, the pre, prelim stuff that we see in the synoptics. But yet Mary knows who Jesus is. She knows what he is capable of. And she trusts that she, he alone, only Jesus, can meet the needs that she perceives. And then what I find most interesting is how she persists. I find this both reassuring and very hopeful. I've always found this dialogue between Mary and Jesus rather confusing. Why did Jesus respond that way? Was it that he wasn't ready that this was the most human part of him coming out? Because he knew the minute he started his ministry, the minute he made such a sign, the proverbial cat was out of the bag and he could never go back to just being the carpenter's son. I also wonder if he wasn't like many of us, just hesitant to get involved hesitant to do something. And as I prayed about this week, I was reminded of a sermon by Dr. Martin Luther King. And his sermon was on the Good Samaritan parable. And in that sermon he preached, the first question which the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Good Samaritan, he reversed that question. He asked, if I do not help this man, what will happen to him? As I said, we don't know what was going on with Jesus, but whatever it was, Mary <clears throat> didn't cave to his reluctance. She continued to press the urgency, if you will. It was this... She gave that look which says, I don't care about your hour. There's a desperate problem right here and now, and you can help them. Be who you are. Do what you can do. And then the last thing that I learned from Mary this week is that Mary instills trust and invites obedience. She simply looks at the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. And I also think it's important that we notice that Mary wasn't the one who fixed the problem, but she sought the one who could. She knew who could, and she didn't ask. She didn't hesitate to ask. In our epistle this morning, Paul writes to the church at Corneth about gifts. He says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And I know that many of you have received emails from me where I use a signature occasionally. And in it, it's one of my favorite quotes from a, a priest back in Boston from one of his sermons. And in it, he said, God's dream is to create a world of one communion, 
a fellowship in love, justice, and compassion. And God calls each of us into the world to participate in that dream by contributing who we uniquely are to this vast tapestry. No one can give what only you or I have to give, and every gift matters. This is what the gospel is calling us to do today, to listen to what God is asking each of us to do, to hear, to see the needs of our neighbors, and then to use our gifts, to use our talents, to use the grace that God has freely given each of us to respond to God's call in caring for one another, which is to live out our baptismal promises. <clears throat> As I often do, perhaps I'm self-projecting here. But I think sometimes my ego, our egos get in the way. That we see something and we kind of feel like, I've got to fix it. When in turn, we actually live in community, we live with each other. And while my gifts may not be able to help this person, I probably do know someone who can. And not only do we see Mary asking Jesus to fix this, Jesus doesn't do it alone either, but has the servants fill, fill the jugs with water. So he too gets help from his community. There is no wine. While it might not be, and it most likely isn't, wine specifically, there is without a doubt a, this time that we are experiencing scarcity. The fact that we are sitting here at an empty church this morning. The fact that so many of us are feeling the isolation of the pandemic the fact that we go to the grocery store and we see bare shelves, the fact that we know so many are hungry, homeless. These are all reminders of the scarcity in our lives. But I believe it's when we focus only on the scarcity that we become blinded to the possibilities, that we become blindness blind to all the goodness and all the blessings in our lives. It's when our vision becomes so myopic on what's not right that we miss all the goodness in our world, which often leads to feelings of helplessness, if not hopelessness. This weekend, we remember Dr. King. And I believe that in his life, what he saw was the possibilities. What he saw was not limited by the reality of his day, but by what could be. And he didn't do it all by himself. He had a community around him, people with all kinds of different gifts and talents that contributed to the movement that he was a part of. My friends, none of us can do this alone. And the beauty is that we don't have to. Last week we renewed our baptismal vows. We renewed that we, like so many others in this world, are believers. And that we are followers of Christ. And just like at the wedding feast, we are part of that community. And like Mary, we have Jesus to turn to in our time of trial, in our time of need, in our time where we need help. They have no wine. Do whatever he tells you. I believe we live in a tension between those two lines. And hopefully we live it well. Let us be open to and confident in the one whose help that we seek because he is good, he is love, and he is the one that came so that we may have life and have it to the fullest. And so my sisters and brothers, let us give thanks for all the blessings in our lives, let us give thanks for each other, 
And while we, even though we can't be here together personally, I know that we are here together in spirit. And our God, our God is with us. Amen. Amen.